Tonight on Plus Politics, we discuss the aftermath of the 2023 elections and the role civil societies played in determining the outcome of the polls. This is Plus Politics. My name is Nyam Gul Agaji. The 2023 presidential election has come and gone because the memory still lingers. It has not come and gone, I beg your pardon. If there are lessons to pick in this whole quagmire, it must be that things may not go as planned, irrespective of what technology, innovation, or level of automation is used for the elections in Nigeria. While civil society have done enormous work improving the Electoral Act, to compensate for electronic involvement in the polls, there seemed to be too much padding on the actual effect the election had on Nigerians. This might be a time for civil society to be wary. If there's ever an opportunity to reform Nigeria's electoral system comprehensively, it is now. After the enormous positives from 2015 that showed progress, it is evident that regression is possible if our voices aren't loud enough or if we cuddle with the institution just to protect our access. One must acknowledge the sheer bravery of Nigerians excited to be part of the electoral season that would lead to a new Nigeria. While the final voter participation rate of 27% falls below the standard, the current statistics also calls for further cleanup of the voter register and intensified voter education towards fuller participation in future elections. While joining us live to discuss this is Adenike Aloba, Program Director, Managing Editor, Datafied, and Jude Ohanele, Program Director, Development Dynamics. Uh, lady and gentlemen, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, let's start with the ladies first, uh, Adenike. Um, let's have your assessment of the 2020. Uh, three elections, beginning from the presidential to the governorship elections. Okay, you're starting from a very high place. Mm. <laughs> uh, assessment has become something hotly contested in the last couple of weeks following the elections. Uh, varying, you know, thoughts, varying uh, agreements on how the elections uh, have panned out. Uh, but, I mean, it is clear that there are several things that need to be adjusted. It is clear that Nigeria still has quite a ways to go uh, with conducting elections. Um, the burning question of everyone's lips, and I feel like the thing that people typically, they, there's some sense, there's a binary sense in which we have been assessing this elections over the last couple of weeks. It's either it was good or it was bad. It was great. Yes, we elected the president. Yes, we've elected governors. Oh, it was bad. Let's start all over again. I, I'm not in any of those binary positions. I don't think the elections should be dumped <laughs> in a dustbin because it was bad. Uh, but I also know that there, there's room for, there's a lot of room for improvement. You mentioned something in your opening statement about the voter register. That the voter turnout in this election has been hotly contested. Oh, it was it low, but people came out to vote. But the reality is that we... It's almost a moot point to begin to debate whether this was real voter turnout when our voter register itself needs a lot of work, a lot of cleanup, a lot of review. Um, it is hard to have conversations about the role of technology in elections, given the challenges that we had with IREV. Uh, during the, uh, the the presidential election, so there 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 were good points. There were there were uh, I mean just the amount of noise and excitement around the elections uh, was a good one. Uh, but are we there? Are we in the place where we're like, yes, we've gotten it. Let's move forward. No, there's still a whole lot to do, a whole lot of reviews, and what I'm hoping will be a whole lot of lessons taken from these elections. Uh, that we can take forward and use to adjust, to tweak, to review uh, coming elections in the coming years. Okay, let me go to Jude as well. Uh, let me have your own review. I'm talking to you uh, this way because this is the first time 
I have met you after the election. So let's just try to get what you feel about what happened on the 25th of March and uh, of February, sorry, and then uh, March 18 as well. Can you hear me, Jude? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Yes, I'm with you. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, go okay. ahead. Okay, yeah. The, the reality of the elections we had uh, this year has actually shown that uh, regression in any democratic experiment is a reality. You know, um, a few major issues based on our observation of the election. The citizens did very well, if you like the positive. The citizens were very excited, very enthusiastic willing to come out and vote, did their best to believe that the process can be better than it used to be. That is a positive in that election. But unfortunately, the election management body, INEC, totally disappointed the people. The whole belief that at the end of the day, the results generated from the polling units will be able to be the determinant, real time, clear to everybody, using the BVPAS and the IREP, did not happen. And that has really made a total uh, mess of the entire effort towards the 2023 elections. Mm -hmm. And as you noted, a lot of excitement and a lot of commitment of the citizenry to that, that this election was actually anchored on this reality because we are all here, we've all been in the country. The challenge has been the missing link between the polling unit and the final result collated. And that was why it took a long time for civil society and all of us involved in it to advocate for an improvement in this process in ways where after every election, beyond the winning party and the neck, other stakeholders can as well come and stick out their neck and say, this election is free. It's fair, it's credible. We thought we would have had that opportunity, but INEC disappointed the entire nation and the world at large. Mm. So essentially, because of what happened on the 25th, where results couldn't be uploaded real time, people were in the dark as to what was going on. And up to date, nobody has said clearly what happened, but it's quite obvious that it was a human failure rather than a machine failure. That now gave the political entrepreneurs opportunity to further mess up the process on the 18th. We saw what happened. So the level of violence was escalated. We had a lot more suppression of votes across the country because it became clear that the deliverables are no longer on the table, that the hopes have been lost. And of course, a lot of the citizens also didn't even bother to come out on the 18th based on the data that are available. So it, it gives you an idea that uh, this 2023 election was actually a huge missed opportunity for this country to have moved in a very powerful, positive force forward. And it's very regrettable. And unfortunately, we're expecting resignations from INEC for this colossal failure. Maybe we've not seen any yet. Mm. And that's uh, a sign of the level of... Uh, mm lack of, you know, clear reality of what is on the ground that we have in the country. Okay, uh, we'll go into specifics, uh, talking about the things that uh, need to be tweaked a, a little bit, like uh, Nika said earlier on. But first of all, let me try to, or let us try to get a picture of what the activities of civil society uh, were like before the elections. Let's get to have that insight into the kind of things that civil society organizations were doing, uh, apart from the fact that uh, we got the, the Electoral Act and so many other little things that people thought would be applied, and this election was going to be very, very free and fair. What other things were you doing before the election so that when we understand this, we know where we are going after now? So let me start with you again. Let me come back to you rather, Nikkei. Okay, I mean, there was a lot of voter education that was happening at the civil society level. Um, a lot of conversations amongst partners, a lot of stakeholder building, coalition building to make sure that 
there, there were eyes on this election to make sure that not only were there eyes on the election, but there's awareness that there's eye on this election. Um, you know, pulling people together, explaining the things that they should be looking out for in the elections, explaining how the Beavers works, explaining how IRF works, uh, trying to help. You know, I was on Plus TV, I remember, I recall before the election yeah. saying, look, INEX communication has been poor through this election process. And, well, the election shows they've not disappointed us in, in that wise. But I think civil society did quite a lot of work trying to bridge that communication gap. Did we do enough? Was it enough? Did we communicate broadly, widely across everyone, across every stakeholder block, across from from the elite to the grassroots? Maybe there's a lot more work that needs to be done. And like I have maintained through this election process that one of the missing opportunities time and time again with election cycles is the thought that an engaged citizenry is simply a citizenry that votes. An engaged citizenry is a citizenry that engages from point A to the very last. That's an engaged citizenry, which means they vote, but they also stay on. They are watching as governance process is ongoing. So is there room for civil society to explore voter education for driving accountability and transparency, which are the real hallmarks, almost like if elections is the fulcrum on which uh, democracy runs? accountability, transparency are the pillars that make it stand. So yes, there's a lot of room for ensuring that we maintain engagement through this process. And personally for me, this is why I can't wait for the noise around all oh, elections to move on because there's a lot more to watch. This is the period where we should be setting agenda for whoever the new, I mean, the new administration setting an agenda putting out the markers, the things that we are going to watch, taking out, you know, uh, all the manifestos and all the talk and marking and asking, okay, is this happening? This is the time to do that. So, yes, civil society played a critical role. And I dare say even on elections, they, as much, as challenging as it was to get real-time on-the-ground information, especially because of the challenges that happened with IREF, civil society did significant was using civic technology to power access to data. I think that if you ask, you know, organizations like Data Fight that had elections dashboard, organizations like Budget, uh, Stairs that had elections dashboard, doing the hard work of making sure that you know, as election results were coming in, as activities were happening at various polling units that the people were aware. It was it was really painful and sad that, you know, a number of citizens started, you know, almost blaming civil society for some of the results that were being shared for their hard work of pushing out, you know, elections data as it was coming in. It was really sad because that was blood and sweat. Uh, trying to make sure that there was some access to information, some access, some sense of what is happening. So, yes, yeah, civil society did a lot of work. Uh, they invested a lot. I'm especially proud of the collaborations that came out during the elections period because it was obvious that one person was obviously not going to be able to make sure everything was happening. And we saw civil society build coalitions, collaborations to power civic education, to power access to information, access to data, is there room to improve, to do better, to reach more people, to make sure that all of that work does not simply die down when election dies down? Yes, there's a lot of room to make sure that we have a truly engaged citizenry. But I think civil society did uh, quite quite some work uh, during the election period. Okay. Uh, well, uh, Jude, in, in, in an attempt to also um, highlight some of the achievements, if you permit, uh, of the civil society. I'd like to also know what the challenges were, things that you can look at, because like Nikkei said, it could have been better than this, even though it was good, but it could have been better than this. So what are some of these challenges, especially uh, those challenges that uh, the people themselves, the citizenry themselves, can key into and make sure that it comes off better next time? What are the challenges that you faced? Well, looking at this election very objectively, it's very difficult to really pick out challenges on the side of the citizen or the electorate and the voters. You know, because the, the basic level, the basic standard on which you will now begin to talk about the participation of the citizens, 
whether it could have some uh, improvement and all that, was not met. You are aware that people turned out to vote. And in various locations across the country, the electoral materials couldn't get to them and they didn't vote. You know, I mean, there is no way you are going to blame those people who took time to come out to vote. And like my sister said, a lot of voter education and a lot of civic education that happened prior to the election contributed to people believing in this process, of course, alongside the improvement in the Electoral Act. And people came out to vote. And, you know, usually because of the way we, they, they also stretch it, the job of INEC is very, very simple if you want to break it down. Basically, to move electoral materials to the polling units with their personnel to have the citizens vote. And, you know, after voting now, with the way it has evolved, it is actually the citizens that count the votes for themselves. Then re results recorded and then transmitted, either manually or digitally. That is the basic job of INEC, beyond every other thing they are talking about and they're engaging in. And there is no way you are going to begin to look at the side of the citizens when this basic, most basic job hasn't been done and was not done on the 25th and got worsened on the 18th of March. You know, because the people came out to vote, so I don't know what else you're going to tell them. For communities that waited at their polling unit from 8 a.m. until 1 p.m. and they saw nobody on the left. I mean, nothing can be better. No, there is no greater sacrifice than patriotism. And as we speak, a lot of them, nobody has told them what happened, no explanation and all that. So when it comes to this... Uh, Hello, Jude. Can you hear me? We seem to have lost uh, the audio from Jude O'Hanley, right? But the missing okay. And then the security agencies that messed up the situation and now. Now the city. Okay, um, Jude, uh, your audio seems to be breaking. We're hoping that uh, you'll rejoin us and uh, continue those line of, uh, that line of thought that you had there. But let me come back to Nikkei. You raised the point that I wanted uh, Jude to talk about. You said it was not actually 100% that you had. You, you could have done more. Uh, and I'm just wondering, because if you go into another election cycle, apart from what you're supposed to do within now, but if you go into another voter education, what can you do differently? What should be done differently or in addition to what you've already been doing so that the voter education can, can be better than it was for the 2023 elections? Okay, so let me pick it up from where uh, Mr. Ohani reached uh, Sort of just leapfrog off something that he said about, you know, the voters being disillusioned and being pained by the outcome of the election. Mm. Um, to say that, Disillusionment is okay, but we can't stay there. So we can't say, oh, we're disillusioned with this. The country continues to exist. And the form and nature of its existence is very reliant on an engaged citizenry. So I will go back and say, you see, development is connected. Development is highly connected. For instance, it was during the elections. I think, in fact, post the, uh, uh, the federal uh, presidential elections, that we started having conversations, started interrogating INEX budget and what they were doing with INEX budget. There has been conversations over and over again before now that talked about, you know, just the state of uh, policing in the country and how many policemen we had. And I know, and I don't want to stoke any emotions by talking about, uh, you know, the, the performances of the uh, um, uh, security sector, essentially the police during the elections. But the reality is we don't nearly have, we don't have nearly enough policemen to effectively police our state. So here is the thing. If we come to elections and we're complaining, agitated by the outcome, if we have not paid attention, done a lot more advocacy, and I'm not talking about advocacy that is, you know, driven by civil society and the select elite. I'm saying advocacy that is people driven. And the only way advo advocacy can be people driven is if those people are aware. And it's understandable, for instance, when we talk about INEX budget, a lot of Nigeria, even though, uh, I mean, organizations like ours analyze the budget, we, we 
brought it out and say, hey, this is how much I make spending on this, on this. But the reality is a lot of people did not know. So this is where I'm saying that voter education has to be end to end. This is where we can do better. This is where we can make sure that, look, there's an opportunity here to say, if you don't want to see what you saw uh, in 2023 elections, well, then you have to pay attention to a lot more things. You have to pay attention to INEX activities from the beginning. We we all remember INEC every four years. But what does INEC do in the lead up to elections? How is it run in the lead up to elections? What are the current developmental challenges, whether that's financing, uh, whether that's uh, oversight that exists within our political infrastructure, within our, our security infrastructure, that could potentially give us another 2023 in four years' time? That is why this is this is where I feel like, yes, it, there's a lot of pain. I mean, whatever side of the argument you're on, some people are not in pain, they're rejoicing. But there's there's a lot of, you know, pain, so to speak, around these current elections. We can't stay in the place of pain. We have to move forward to say, how do we learn from this? And this is where I feel we have a room. We have an opportunity to help people connect the dots. To say, listen, guys, this outcome is not a one-day outcome. The outcome you're complaining about is not an elections February 25, March 18th outcome. This is a four-year outcome, an outcome that is four years in the making. So if you don't want to have similar outcomes, then you have to pay attention. You have to pay attention. How many Nigerians are even aware how your name makes it onto a ballot? So we had a lot of people complaining, my name, our, our candidate's name was not on the ballot or somebody's name was. How many of us are aware of the process? There's a lot of, I mean, again, I will talk about the agitation against police and stuff like that. If a gang of thugs come up and show up to two policemen uh, who have who are managing one gun in between them, you really think that they should jump in front of the fire to protect the ballot, where they are obviously outnumbered. So these are not issues that are simply connected to election. Look. Whether anybody agrees or not, whatever argument, these elections are shown, and this is where I disagree a little bit with uh, Mr. Ohanele when he was talking about, oh, you know, how do we blame the citizens? This election has shown that Nigerians are still voting the way they've always voted, along religious and ethnic uh, 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 preferences and sensibilities. So how do we change that? If that is not the best way to approach democracy, if that is obviously unhealthy for our democracy, how do we turn this around? How do we change the narrative? There's a lot of toxic, problematic narratives right now passing on everywhere. And sometimes maybe in just the energy of, oh, we really have to talk about what happened. We're not looking forward to what can be, what is possible. I think we have a room here to begin to shape narratives. We have a room here to begin to connect the dots for people. So that, and again, I'm saying this and I've been repeating it everywhere. An engaged citizenry is not just a citizen that show up, uh, that shows up to vote. An engaged citizen is not just a citizen who shows up to vote. An engaged citizen is a citizen who is involved in governance from point A to point Z. Mm. Which means that by the time we get to elections period, citizens know who not to vote for. By the time we get to elections period, we know the parastatals, we know the agencies that are not fit, that are not ready. And we can begin to raise alarm, talk about it in the lead up to elections. So I am saying, and I know this is very unpopular opinion, let the elections process, let the uh, 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 court process and all of that, let it go through, let it happen. But we have a big assignment ahead of us. An assignment that we have to be clear is either we're shaping narratives to keep this country together, to keep democracy functioning, or we're powering narratives to say it's not worth it, let's all just throw our hands up in the air and forget everything. Okay, uh, well, uh, we're still talking about uh, the outcome of the elections. And... Uh, we need to look at the way forward, but we'll take a short break now. When we return, we go into specifics of how to go about that. Stay with us. Okay, you're welcome back. It's still Plus Politics on Plus TV Africa. And um, we're talking with uh, Adenike Aloba, Program Director, Managing Editor of Data Fight, and also Judo Hanele, Program Director, Development Dynamics. Um, well, an election circle is basically like three, 
before the election, or for, before the election, during the election, after the election, before the inauguration, and then after that, what happens when the people are sworn in and they begin to uh, govern our country, Nigeria. We've talked about what happened before the elections. Right now, after the elections, between this time and the date for inauguration, which is hopefully on the 29th of May, there have been a series of lit litigations. And it is expected that the people who were advocating for a better Nigeria, educating the people and all that, at that time, will also be interested in this period where there are litigations, court cases are there and all that, and looking into what is really going on. So I'd like to just find out, what is the civil, uh, civil society doing in this period um, leading up to the inauguration? How are you following uh, the litigations in the courts and all that? Uh, what possible outcome are you looking at? Let me begin with you, uh, Jude O'Hanele. Uh, well, you know, the challenge here is that um, as a country, you know, this um, bongo election has moved us so many years backwards. And uh, it's important that we understand that because without clear accountability and responsibility for actions taken, you know, we won't move as a country. And that's why we're where we are. Like my sister Nikki talking about moving forward, moving forward to where and from where. You know, we they, 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 and they got all the support they needed from civil society, from the international community, from every corner in this world. And they continued to promise that this election was going to be an improvement. We we're all here in 2015 when we had an election, when uh, Professor Tahiru Jega was the INEC chair. And we saw how somebody considered on the basis of the reality of the fact that the election was won and lost. And you expect that we were to move forward from that point to the level where post-election litigation will no longer be an issue in the polity. If they tell you the amount of money and the amount of, you know, the, the time of the judiciary that is wasted on these election petitions that we can do without. Because usually if the election is properly conducted, the citizens will make their choice. You know, and like Nikkei said, I also disagree because you wouldn't know how people are voting if the results are not clearly brought out real time and you look at them. If you look at Lagos results, for instance, the presidential election in Lagos, you will discover the discrepancy between what INEC published and what the political parties were able to put together in their various situations. You see that Nigerians have also started get, get moving beyond uh, religion and ethnicity in their voting pattern. But INEC made it very difficult for that to become very clear and clear. But there are signs that people were moving beyond religion and ethnicity. So moving forward, really, the, the country has not been this slow with election. And unfortunately, for somebody to think that what worked in 2007 when Mori Siwu and his group messed up the election can happen in 2023 and people will move on with it, it, it is very, very difficult. It is obvious because people invested a lot of energy, emotion, and commitment to this process. And they need to see a transparent process. If you lost, you see it glaringly that you've lost. And then you can begin to plan for the next set of uh, elections and uh, your involvement in the governance process and all that. But now people are stuck with this heavy disbelief. And there, nobody is taking responsibility. INEC failed woefully with the billions of Naira spent. The whole citizens do not need to know how INEC spent the money. But the citizens know that INEC failed the country. An average child in secondary school is asking, is it, is it, why is it difficult for Nigerians to just cast votes and count? I didn't know what to tell the, the child. So the issue is that really the mood of transition is, has been compromised. The problem we are having is now is that we, are, we have on our hand a very mangled and dismembered mandate. I don't know what is going to happen, but like has been said, of course, the process is that people will go to court. It is hoped that the courts will be able to sort this out. But the mood of the nation is such that this glaring underperformance, woeful failure by INEC, has put this country in a very, very big, big challenge in terms of moving forward. Okay, well, and the uh, whole issue of transition uh, in, in, in just May a moment, Jude. And all of that just a moment, Jude. A challenge. Just a moment. Yeah. Uh, my question really is whether INEC did well or not. 
is no longer an issue. It's, it's left for the courts to say that what happened was not supposed to happen because INEC itself has said that it did a fantastic job. And then the federal government, by proxy, is also saying that INEC did a fantastic job. So it's left for the evidences before the court to prove whether they did a fantastic job or not. Because if there were discrepancies or if the the mode of transmission, for instance, was done against the law, is the courts that will determine. My question was, how interested is the civil society in this stage of our electoral process, which is going to court as it is, because that's the popular phrase right now, going to court. How interested is the civil society, and how do you intend to follow these? Or will you wait, or will the civil society wait, or are they supposed to wait till after the court cases are won and lost, then they continue the advocacy from there? That's the question I'm really asking. Well, basically, of course, uh, some members of the civil society are interested in observing the court processes. So definitely they will go to observe the court processes and see what happens. Because at, at this level, there is little civil society input. It's about uh, the, you know, th those who are challenging the elections and those who believe that the election was clearly fair. But I'm also uh, clear that you as a citizen also was here when all of this happened. And as a people, if we continue to lie to ourselves, we'll remain where we are. So the reality is that people will look at that. And, you know, a lot of people have their challenges with the judiciary as well. You've seen some of the pronouncements that I've made in the past that were very shocking, even to basic people in primary school who couldn't understand rationale of some of those judgments as, as basic as they are. So the Nigerian judiciary also has a lot of job to do to be able to redeem the image of the judiciary alongside that of the country. So it's expected that they will go there. But what I'm trying to let you know is that we could have avoided all of this. But unfortunately, we are where we are. And we need to be able to call out those who brought us to this mess. This is seriously things that can be av avoided. The transmission of results was muted. And now we are here with several litigation, including people who would have gone home happily that they lost the election with a transparent process. So we are where we are, really, my brother. And what we need to do now is to hope that the courts will do the most they can. But personally, I believe that the courts have been overburdened over the years. We have a lot of issues that our courts can deal with. But we keep bringing this in every four years, flooding with all these electoral cases that are really, really not their issue because we have an electoral system and an election management body that has not been performing. So we hope that the courts will do this. The society will only continue as we do insist that people should be able to be calm, people should be able to voice their whatever issues they have in a civil manner and commit and believe that the process will deliver. And at the end of the day, whatever the results are, people will also be able to take their decision on what to do next. But what I'm trying to put across here clearly is that this is absolutely avoidable. This country was put into this by people who acted out of personal interest as against national interest. Okay, let me come to Nikkei. I'd like to take you back a little bit. When we were talking, I, I mentioned something, yeah. and you also uh, were very vehement about it when you were talking about it. You said uh, the, uh, the register, the voter register needs a cleanup. It needs to be revisited and all that. So yeah. when you were saying it, uh, what did you have in mind? Why is it so important? What are the things that need to be done with the voter register yeah. and all that? Um, I think there's, there's need for almost like a purge, and that's that's the word I've been using, which means going through that voter register with a fine tooth comb and removing everything that is extraneous. Extraneous will be people who have died, people who have relocated. Um, that that is the work that needs to be done, and in every normal functioning societies that would be easy, but for Nigeria it probably will take some work. And so here is what I mean when I say, look, it's all well and good that we express our disappointment over the current, but here is the thing for me. And this is where, again, this is unpopular opinion. This is where it is, it comes to live or die for me. Governance is not about the individual who wins the election. There are real issues of governance and this voter register is an issue of much more than an issue of just elections. It's an issue of governance. Where a government agency has a register of people who are 
their names in that register basically puts the power in their hands to determine who votes or does not vote. And that government agency now needs to do the work. I mean, we heard all kinds of things during the elections. People who saw their dead mothers, their dead grandfathers, uh, names at polling unit posted out as voters who were coming to vote. Again, this is this is where the math the math is important. And like Gen Z will say, the math is not nothing. If we're comparing voter turnout to a voter register of 97 million, it will be low. Because obviously we do not have 97 million registered voters. And so this is, it, it's literally a porch. It's literally going through that register with a fine tooth comb and removing everything that is extraneous. Let's know what the figure of Nigeria's 14 population. I think this is where it's important for civil society. If we know these numbers by region, we know those numbers, uh, data given to us, broken down by demographics, by location, it allows us to even plot a graph of how to engage with the citizens. Oh, this is where the voting population is. This is the age range of the voting population. A lot of people, and again, unpopular opinion, a lot of people are saying, oh, a lot of people registered. But if you look at the age range of those who registered, you may wonder if there were other motivations for registering beyond voting. Perhaps people just wanted IDs. But again, to respond to your question, what I mean by a review of the voter register is literally taking, and I know I'm being very simplistic when I say we need INEC to go back and say, Ajibola Okechukusoni presenza for that voter register. Because that's the, that's, that's, Faulty data will always land us in trouble. Faulty data will always land us in trouble. And that's what we need to do with the voter register. Uh, do you so think, that we can have an accurate figure. We do you think INEC has an that capacity figure. to do that? Because um, registers are presented to INEC. I don't know if INEC is, is directly involved in identifying the people on the register uh, at any time. Do you think they have the capacity to do that? And even if they do have... Uh, what other organization or what other body, what kind of people should champion this cause of yeah. making sure the registers are cleaned as clean as possible? Thank you very much for that question. I was hoping you would ask because it's a very important follow-on question. How many agencies, parastatals, collect our data as Nigerians? NIN collect it. Customs, uh, uh, immigration collect our data. In terms of institutions, banks collect our data. There is room, civic technology, technology, just technology is in the place where this is possible. This is not, this is not uh, 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 further maths in that sense. It, it's not placing further maths in front of a three-year-old. It is possible. It does mean we have to examine what kind of collaborations can exist between the, the registration for NIN between our collection of passports, uh, between our BVN. I mean, one of the reasons when BVN was introduced, it was around the idea of we want to know who the real Nigerians are, we want to know the ones who have bank accounts. So there is that data. NIN came out and it was compulsory. Everybody must have a, a national identity number. Everybody must have a national identity number. And they've continued that drive. So how can we facilitate a collaboration between these institutions, I mean, amongst these institutions and organizations to make sure that somehow this voter registration, because we, honestly, the truth is, even if we say, okay, let's remove all the other parastatals, I neck through pain and hurdles and stress, INEC managed to increase voter registration in the, in the lead up to these elections. Significant numbers of new registrations. So if we can do that, if INEC could manage a system where people were able to transfer their voters' cards, people were able to re-register when their cards had either been lost or they missed an opportunity to register or complete, then it is possible. But I'm also saying that there is room within all the parastatals of government, within all the bodies that collect our data in Nigeria to facilitate a cleaner voter register. Is it going to be a perfect, uh, 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 perfect process? Probably not. Um, nothing in Nigeria seems to work the first time or is perfect. Let me, let me rephrase. Nothing in Nigeria is perfect the first time. And so there's opportunity for us to give. So this is what I mean about moving forward to begin to examine institutions. This is governance to say, 
it can't be impossible for us to clean up our voter register. So what do we need to do? If this is the time, if we don't have, and I imagine that the answers I'm giving now, there are probably some stakeholders who are thinking, oh, they don't know, this can be done better. So let's facilitate stakeholder conversations to say, how do we review our voters register? This is not a conversation that is going to happen one year to elections, to 2027 elections, where a lot is hot, everybody is campaigning for their candidate and all of that. That is a conversation that needs to start happening now. So if we need to come up with some strategy document to say, hey, this is our proposal as civil society or the entire stakeholder value chain, uh, uh, CBOs, uh, 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 um, workers' organizations, you know, this is our strategy for cleaning up our voter register. And then we can submit that to government and then enhance advocacy around it. Somehow the electoral law got passed. It took some time, but it got passed. We passed FOI law in this country. It took some time, but it got passed. So it means right after coming up with a strategy, something to make sure that the voter register is clean, then we have to power that with advocacy and say, we want to make sure you're listening. We want to make sure that you're going to take action. And so it, it's... I'm not simplifying the task or making it seem as if, oh, they just have to do presents like they do in primary school. But I'm saying it is possible. There mm -hmm. are institutions within our current uh, governing structure, our current uh, uh, administrative structure as a nation that can facilitate the collaboration for INEC to review the voter register. The voter register is core to INEC's function because the voter register is what they use to plan their budget. The voter register is what they used to purchase or prepare a uh, 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 voting material. So it's actually really critical to their work. Yeah. So if they're saying, look, it's impossible for us to do this by ourselves, now is the time to begin to, begin to facilitate conversations to make sure that it gets done. If one strategy doesn't work, we have four years to try and try and try until we find one that works. Okay. Uh, well, uh, let, let me come to Jude. No matter the outcome of the court cases that we have, People who are grieved have gone to the courts and they are saying a lot of things. They are hoping for outcomes that may or may not come. But no matter what the outcome is going to be, we are going to have another government sworn in on May 29th. Or at least, let's, let's just, like Nigerians will say, bad as a bad. Before the end of the year, we're going to have another government. But Nike said something earlier on about, whole, about accountability. So I'm starting with you. What are some of the suggestions you would have for the citizenry, for the civic society, for the government, and everybody who is a stakeholder? What are the strategies to use to make sure that these people who have been elected into office can give account of what they do? They can be held accountable for whatever they're doing in office. What are some of your suggestions, sir? Yeah, you know, accountability is a continuum, really. And uh, one of the worst things uh, against accountability is the impunity. You know, in, in, in an atmosphere of impunity, it is difficult uh, to really push the agenda of accountability. You know, so moving forward, like you noted, of course, some people will have to govern this country as we move. And then the real issues around it is how well they are going to govern us. So if you narrow it down to accountability and governance, it's essentially looking at what the job of these people that are supposedly elected and those who are elected are. Essentially, the job of every government across the federal and state and also local government is to go there and prepare the budget for four years and implement those budgets. Along the lines of doing that, handle other issues of states that will lead to the welfare and security of the citizens. That's essentially as simple as it can be the job of those who are elected into public offices. So essentially, the engagement moving forward is for us to totally get involved and engage with the budget process. And that's where the missing link had been over the years. So people get into office, mismanage public resources. In most of the states, really, you can't talk of a budget you are looking at. At the federal level, we started getting it right to a point when we move away from the padding of uh, budgets, which was one of the good things that President Buhari triggered when he came into office. The whole discussion about making the budget a real document as against um, 
uh, a document padded by personal and uh, parochial interests. So we move from there, but also the whole challenge of translating that budget document to realities on the ground has been a huge issue. Citizens haven't been able to engage. Also because government has not shown leadership. So part of it is that the citizenry will need to be strengthened and need to strengthen themselves okay. along the lines of insisting on budget discipline okay. and insisting on engaging the budget process All and right. beginning to understand how it runs and how government resources are either spent or wasted and then begin to correct it from there. Of okay. course, there are other institutions of state, like the Office of the Auditor General at all levels, which have been weakened over the years because of the ongoing impunity. And of course, you know, at every point you have elections in any country, what the election does is to revalidate your accountability processes. And at any time you miss that, it becomes a huge burden on the citizens. Okay. So with the level of um, failure and impunity we have in the system, the citizens have a lot of work to do, and everybody has to be part of it. Those of you in the media, those of us in civil society, and every other person hoping that uh, people in government will realize that their job is not to put all of us at risk, but Thank to you. improve on the lives of the people. Thank you. Um, if, you if you may, uh, Nikkei, in 30 seconds, if you may, uh, your own suggestions, how to uh, hold these people accountable, because our time is actually up. So, yeah. uh, very fast. I mean, my, my suggestion would be we need a lot of um, spotlight on government at the sub-national level on governance at the subnational level. Yes, we have to pay attention to the federal, hence all the noise and agitation and emotions around the presidential elections. But it lives and dies at the subnational level. The budgets that are being spent, what the budgets are being spent on, uh, the kind of institutional challenges that make it difficult for governance to reach the people, for service delivery to get to the people who need it the most, the ones who are the most in, endangered, who feel the most impact uh, of, of the failure of uh, uh, democracy, the failure of service delivery. Um, and so I would say that we need a lot of attention uh, at the subnational level. We need a lot of education for citizens to understand what the processes are, okay. to understand how they can engage those processes. So that okay. would be it in 30 seconds. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, Adenike Aloba, a program director and managing editor data fight thank you so much for coming on the program today and also jude ohanele program director development dynamics thank you so much for being a part of our program today thank you well we've been talking with adenike aloba program director managing editor data fight and jude ohanele program director development dynamics and uh, we were looking at the aftermath of the 2023 elections and what we need to do to move on and move forward. Until tomorrow, when we come again with another edition of Plus Politics, on behalf of the entire team of Plus Politics, my name is Nyam Gul Agaji. Thank you for being there.